Let's get it going. Mm -hmm. Want to do the welcome to the facility? Sure. Okay. Hey guys, welcome to Facility D20. I'm Mike and this is Troy. And uh, we're back with another one of these uh, counter setup videos where uh, we're going to go through the maps and the view from the DM and player's point of view. So this time, um, our party found themselves uh, back in Boulder's Gate. And one of our players who's a warlock, his grand mission in this campaign is to learn enough dance moves to challenge his patron, the fairy god, Hersum or Hersum, to a dance-off to free his captive parents from under his control. So because of that, he's been going around to all these port cities, going through all the theaters and playhouses and taverns and sing songs that he could find. So he got word of this crazy um, brothel, because we're in Boulder's Gate, yeah. uh, that he decided to check out so he could learn some dance moves. So in this particular setup, I wanted to make um, the party feel like they were in... Uh, not so much a tavern, but more like a like a club, more like a like a dance club, like a real like a heavy feel as you can get for a fantasy setting, like you know. So, I have done a few things to try to set this up here. Um, I'll take you through the video and explain some of uh, what I call the 2D setup that I did for this map, which I threw together fairly quickly. It was um, not overly elaborate, but it worked out pretty well. So uh, we'll go ahead and I'll, we'll run that video, and then we'll discuss a little bit. So this was a pretty simple setup. I started off with this battle mat by Patreon Elvin Towers. I picked it up because I had a nice big stage in the middle and in a bar and a lot of tables. I think it was called Dancing Hall. Uh, it worked really well for this particular situation. You can see here with the stage and the, the gnome band in the back, we have some private booths along the side. Uh, a lot of the scatter terrain is pieces from terrain crate, tables and bottles and bars and barrels. Uh, the walls here, I added some, um, I just turned them around and added some dungeon tiles. These are my own tiles that I drafted in Blender, but they're basically a carbon copy of the Dwarven Forge style. So I just want to add those around the walls to kind of give this place like a, um, a 3D feel. Then I jammed it full of minis here. Um, I made sure to have this bouncer here at the front of the door and over here this is where I decided to put the lobster fighting tank along this long narrow here and this um, table the party is currently sitting at was an empty table it's where they decided to sit down when they came in. Uh, along the sides here again are the private booths and uh, you can see that D6 just went flying in amongst the encounter and there goes the D12. So while I was trying to film this video, uh, my toddler decided he was going to crawl up behind the DM screen and uh, start firing dice at all these minis here. So he's kind of taking them out one at a time, but nah, I figured whatever. It's pretty much how we roll here in Facility D20. So guys, I just wanted to give you a quick showcase of this map here and let you guys know that sometimes, you know, just a simple um, printed map with a few pieces can really make a, an encounter pop. Clap so for editing. Yeah, I know, actually probably would help. <laughs> Some of the things I was trying to do here with this setup was um, I wanted to make the players feel a bit uneasy, uh, a little bit nervous, but also up for a good time. So in describing this atmosphere, I decided to pack the place with a lot of NPCs and a lot of uh, miniatures to get in there to make it have a full feel. I also had the interior of the building lit up with dancing lights, but dancing lights of all different colors. So you kind of had like a real... A, like a strobe effect. Like a strobe effect, yeah. I had like a real like um, club atmosphere with flashing neon lights around in a fantasy type setting. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of live music. There was a um, band of gnomes, a five string <laughs> band of gnomes in the background playing. Um, there was a lot of booth and NPC set up. Um, and also I had the bouncer at the door, like this big, burly, hairy version of Wreck-It Ralph, <laughs> kind of greeting the party at the door. And I believe he was saying something along the lines of, uh, the bouncing boulder is not responsible for any pain or pleasure. Yeah. Uh, do you accept this? And then the, 
the party would enter if they accept it. And I, I did that to kind of set the mood of like, oh, this... Wait. It was a fair warning to what we were going into that we had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so once they got in there, I kind of had, um, I was playing your typical fantasy tavern music on the app, and just, mm -hmm. we had that going, and I described the room as very busy and, and very jovial. Of course, the party got drinks, they went to the bar, they sculpted it out, and our role player, who's got a bit of a notorious reputation, for being a pirate, um, we had a wanted poster um, on the wall for her, but it was like a rip wanted poster, like somebody had already taken a had piece already of taken a piece. Yeah, so I did that to kind of set the mood of like, uh -oh. okay, you're you're being watched here. Yeah. So did you feel like that that came across or? Yeah, you... we definitely felt like we kind of we didn't well. It felt like we needed to keep a low profile, but it definitely didn't happen. <laughs> These guys keep don't, don't keep a low profile anywhere. Yeah. So I also wanted to have a bit of fun tonight because it was we were just coming off this big chase and this big battle. So I kind of wanted it like a like more of an RP light fun session. And we've done a lot of the tavern stuff. We've played darts and cards and and gambling and and fighting contests and arm wrestles and and you name it. So I was thinking. What can we do here to have a bit of fun? And I know on Critical Role, I believe they did a, a lizard race yeah, one time. Yeah, yeah. And I like the idea of something like that, but we're a seafaring campaign with the ghosts of Saltmar, so I thought, oh, I can't really do that. So what I decided to do was have a, uh, a lobster fight, a yeah. lobster fighting pit. So in the corner of the bar, uh, there was this big fish tank where I described um, these two lobsters who were... Who were going at it and we had a bookie there a gnome in a pinstripe suit uh, real gangster style yeah <laughs> he was going around placing bets and i knew as soon as i laid that bait that the party was going to jump all over as it. soon as we saw that we were like that's gonna happen as uh, as i mentioned before I was playing a druid i was like well i'm going to somehow stack a mile high amount of buffs and wild shape into a lobster and that's how we're going to enter this contest <laughs> so we ended up uh we had the bard inspire me, and we had, uh, I casted, Will throughout this, where we, uh, Troy said before, we're a seafaring campaign, and my druid is, uh, a seafaring druid. I don't, it, like, he's not the typical druid, like, I've never been into the wild, like, the wilds. In the was, forest. In the forest or anything like that, so I have tailored all of my spells and reskinned them so that, uh, they're all affected the sea, like, my fairy fire is rolling sea foam. And uh, my bark skin spell is actually, it coats me in almost like a oyster shell, where it's like a black oily cover, and it makes it that black sheen. So what I have done is I casted bark skin on myself and shifted into a, uh, <laughs> a, uh, a lobster, so that I was a lobster with a black sheen shell. So that was... Uh, that was a telltale sign that the bookie didn't keep up on. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the bird buffed them and then between the bird and the warlock with the super high charismas and the deception checks they uh, kind of went around them to make out that this lowly old lobster wasn't going to be much of a challenge for the local champion and uh, we also had the old uh, blue <laughs> yeah, we also had the uh, the temporary hit buff uh hit points oh. from the uh, inspiring leader feet so <laughs> it was pretty much the most jacked up lobster that you could probably put in D and D. Uh, so what we used for it was uh, the crab stat block. <laughs> if you're looking for it, <laughs> if you ever need to fight a lobster, we used the crab stat block with a couple extra hit points to make it a little, a little more fun. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you think that went over as a fun encounter? Oh, that was a blast. We had an absolutely great time. We had, uh, we had the warlock who was posing as the fisherman who had lost all of his money on the bet before because he bet against <laughs> Old Blue because we he knew the setup was that Old Blue was probably going to win his first fight to set the stage. So he went up and he spent uh, he said I only made 10 golds all I got in my name put it all on the other uh, all on the other uh, crab because he was getting like 3 to 1 odds. 3 to 1 and odds. He's yeah. like I need to triple my money here. I need to triple my money. Obviously he, he lost. lost. <laughs> he lost flat out. So he posed and he uh, he posed. He said, "Well, I have a lobster that we caught off of the boat. Can we enter it in?" And the, he said, "Well, 
Old Blue's already had one fight, so let me have to see this lobster. So when they went and got me. I play. <laughs> he showed me the lobster. Uh, they showed him me, and I was uh, I was like making out that I was blind. I could barely walk. <laughs> had, a, had a limp. I had a limp. And when they put me into the water, I flipped over on my back, and I could barely <laughs> even move. Like I spent like a good five ten minutes trying to get up off my back. So as soon as the uh, the the bookie seen that, he jumped all over it. A super high charisma roll, so mm. that's the rule of cool there. So we have our druid here, and we're a seafaring campaign, and he wants to tweak all these spells and rules to make it narratively fit a seafaring campaign. And I was like, yeah, man, like that <laughs> sounds cool. So yeah. anytime your players are kind of trying to tweak little bits of rules here and there to, to suit their player or their character, like uh, I highly recommend you let them do that because it lets them be more immersed in their game and feel more connected to their character. So after that, of course, <laughs> it kind of eased the party, I think, and it kind of lost their um, tension, their nervousness about it, uh, which is what I was yeah, going for. We definitely to after, get them at ease. Yeah, after we finished that, and we got a big payout from the fight because we had the lobster in the fight. We got half the purse. Yep. So uh, all of, we set all of our crew up to drink for the night. Uh, one other thing we should mention too is that as we're sailing from port to port, one of the magic items that we have come across, we, I have I have three of them now, which are the magical decanters. But I have one for ale, one for wine, <laughs> and one for water. Yeah. So we've become rum runners, rum runners up, up, up <laughs> along the coast. And for every tavern and bar we get to, we try to peddle our wares to anyone who will pretty much listen yeah. and strong arm people who don't. So. If you're doing a seafaring campaign, you're going to have two problems. You're going to give yourself, you're going to give your players a map, and you're going to give your players a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and she's going to go off the rails. So if you're like, oh, they're just going to end up run, running rum, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, so after, of course, after the lobster battle, and everybody was kind of jolly and happy and a few drinks in i had them roll constitution saving throws and i put the dc at 12 not too high but high enough that i was hoping a few players were going to get drunk and of mm -hmm. course everybody except our warlock warlock <laughs> passed and the warlock was the reason we were there <laughs> yeah. so he spent the rest of the game using the poison rules mm -hmm. which has disadvantage on attack and, rolls and ability checks and ability checks so he was kind of um he was kind of feeling pretty good, if you know what I mean. Yeah, he was not feeling any pain for that point in time. So, of course, why we came here was this performance. And I'm after going through many different types of performances. There was a theater. There was a, play, there was a clown and puppet show. There, yeah. was, there was a lot of stuff. So I'm kind of like um, running out of things here to do because uh, I think this is our fifth or sixth stop now to learn how to dance. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to um, do like a... Uh, a group dance like like fifth harmony or, harmony or the pussycat dolls or, or something like that and a yeah. whole choreographed dance with uh these um red skin tieflings and the reason i use the red skin tieflings is because we're in Baldur's gate and there's there's a lot of them there and it's uh it just it seemed like it fit well with the with the bouncing boulder did it have anything to do with the uh Bakai being a tiefling himself uh, no, not necessarily, no. Because I think that really immersed him a little bit more, I think. I, I think it did, too. Like, yeah. Looking back on it, yeah, I never thought about it, but yeah, I think I remember when I said they were, they were a bunch of tieflings, he really... Yeah, he almost perked up a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. So, of course, I had them go out, and I, they done their whole, their whole choreographed dance, and I described them, you know, dancing here and there and whatnot, and um, this time is something I haven't done before. I... Switch, switch the music over, mm -hmm. like you've probably noticed, yep. to like actual music. Okay. Yeah. So like dance music. I, I tried to find some music with like um, just string bands and pianos and stuff. So like I managed to get three songs like that, but mm -hmm. I think the battle was like an hour and a half. Yeah. That the following battle that's about to happen. So like I kind of ended up getting into some of the other yeah. uh, Delupa was... soundtracks. Um, but d did it? Did that give a sense of? true to battle having like dance party music on from it was super like uh have you seen the movie uh what was it percy jackson yes so it felt like we were in the casino and where like everyone was getting uh eating the lotus eater uh, things yeah. so that's why i, I like when, when the uh the dancers came down and they ended up turning into a bunch of succubuses 
I thought that we were in a lotus eater situation where oh. everyone around us was just hypnotized by the beauty and then like under their trance and we were like, oh shit. Yeah, we were in trouble. <laughs> and so like I had, while this battle was going on, so the grand finale of um, this battle is that these tieflings, I had them transform into angel-like beings at first, almost like celestials. And that was just to give like a wow, like we've never seen a performance like this kind of factor. I had them go out into the crowd, and then as the grand finale, plant the, um, the draining kiss, I believe it's called, yeah. uh, on the party. and Because that hits hard. I oh, think yeah. that hits like 5d10 plus yeah. 5. And it drains your maximum hit points, which is not very nice in yeah. combat. So I wanted to, so we kind of snuck that in there. As soon as that happened, I had them like transfer uh, over to succubuses. Um, and then, of course, the party was kind of freaking out a bit. And true, the, this battle that unfolded, they were like looking around, but like all the crowd was yes. just kind of watching them. Yeah, and they were like, everything was fine. This is what gave me the whole Lotus Eater yeah. Den feel to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I ran six succubuses against the party of uh, five level 12 12. characters here and And it was rough it was it was pretty rough especially because they were actually coming off a battle so they were partially now we we had just finished fighting the uh the master assassin arc mage and we were all pretty much tapped yeah so it was ended up being a fairly difficult battle so they managed to win this thing out uh after a while after our bird gave in to the sword of Kaz that he was carrying around. Which is a story for another video, but that sword <laughs> of Kaz has been uh, a lot of fun in this campaign. So if you ever flipping through that DMG, and you're looking at this crazy shit that you're like, I can't give these players that, give it to the players. <laughs> Just <laughs> give it to them. <laughs> as much trouble as that sword of Kaz has given him, it has given us much more. Yeah. So... He pulled it out in the middle of that battle, and which caused a lot of problems for him and the group. But at the end of the battle, when they killed these succubuses, I just had them like blink out of existence and reappear back on the stage as the dancers. So luckily, they kind of got killed off quickly once they went. It was like almost like one, and in the next round, boom, well, boom, boom. once what? that sword of cast got pulled out, and he cast a divine word or a divine word out of it, and yeah. I think it's like four of them blinked out. Yeah, it was it was rough. Rough for the succubuses. Mm-hmm. So once they finished, we had uh, the dancers finish with their big grand finale of synchronized dance moves, mm-hmm. take a bow, and leave the stage, all except for the one, the main one. Mm-hmm. And all the crowd, of course, jumped up and ship. applauding, including their shipmates who spent the last few nights at the Bouncing Boulder while these guys rode at sea. <laughs> so beware of the one free table at the bar yes because i put one free table right at the front like front and center of the stage and the party didn't even question why this table was free we were like oh free table this is where he wants us to sit i guess (laughs) (laughs) i was nervous because i was like oh if they don't take that table it's kind of going to change the plan for the performance because that's that's the table that the the dancers go to kind of an ingenious placement too because it was right next to the lobster fighting pit because where we had scoped that out we yeah. sat there to scope the uh, the scope the fights out and to plan what we were going to do, and where we had some people out of range so they wouldn't be seen if they were helping out or trying to interfere in the fights if something had for some reason gone wrong where I couldn't fight a challenge rating zero crab by myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. So you're right, ready with a couple of uh, verbal spells at the ready. Yeah. So once this was done, it turned out to be a big illusion. And I crafted a homebrew item called uh, an Orb of Illusion, performance only. (laughs) (laughs) So essentially this orb, its entire function is to uh, create a psychic connection with the user, concentration for 10 minutes, for to display a grand illusion. But the illusion, here's here's a trick so this won't be used (laughs) in a breaking fashion. (laughs) Like the candle you gave us? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It can only be used to... um, to do song or dance or performance. So it can't be used to fake a battle. It can't be used to fake a robbery. It can't be used in that Mm -hmm. way. It has to be a performance in front of a crowd. And I needed a magic item to give to like your lowly warlock who's (laughs) going to go dance off with a fey god. So I've kind of been giving him, I think I give him some special dancing shoes that gives him a plus. Blue suede shoes. Blue suede shoes (laughs) that gives him a plus on his dance. 
uh, an extra plus on his dance moves and mm-hmm. performance checks. So he's working up to this big dance up. So after this was all done, of course, uh, the party talked to the dancers. He learned a little bit. He's got some dancing experience. Um, so how did you feel about that? The whole like uh, pull the rug out on Rhea with this with this fight. Uh, it felt like we've spent so much time pulling your plans out from under you <laughs> that it was like a nice turned table. Uh, I was surprised they didn't really, you didn't catch on too. Oh, we had no idea. No one at the table had any clue what was going on. And, Not a little bit. And the sword of cast got pulled for no reason whatsoever. Yeah, and as soon as it came back, the bard who was struggling, who never managed to pull it during the uh, fighting the assassin that killed his family... He managed to keep it under control for that, but when he thought everybody else was going to die, he pulled it, and to find out it was an illusion, he was upset. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that was that was our uh, D&D tavern encounter. So a few things like I wanted to come across when you're building a set like this. You don't you can do a simple paper mat, a few 3D pieces really perks it up and helps. Um, if you're in a tavern, you want it to be a fun time. You want drinks. You want to make sure you try to get that... Um, Constitution saving throw in there for those drinks. Try to get somebody poisoned because it's always fun when somebody's drunk. Yep. Um, you know, it can be sometimes it could be a little like, uh, oh, we're going to go to like a brothel or a tavern. Like, you could get a little like, yikes, what's going to happen in here? But you know what? Nine times out of ten, the power day just rolls with it and it's, yep. it's just a lot of fun. Um, so, overall, I thought that the encounter and the map and the what I had set up there worked pretty well. I thought it turned out really well. Um, I would have liked to have a few more scatter pieces of terrain, but I got them all in a box somewhere amongst the move to the to the new yeah. studio here, so I couldn't find all the little pieces. And the best part about having all that scatter terrain around is you're more likely to interact with your surroundings if you see it visibly. Yes, that is an excellent point. I've found in my experience that, like, if you put a little table there, I don't know if some people don't have this stuff, but if you had a little table there with a little cup and a little little plate and stuff on it, mm-hmm. there's man, the chances that your party's going to tip it over and, and use it for cover or throw it a plate or break a bottle and use it, like it, like it exponentially increases oh, yeah. like when you can see something on the table. And some of the, uh, some of the sets we're able to put together now between myself and Troy with having access to three 3D printers between the two of us. Yeah. Uh, we're able to manufacture some impressive set pieces yeah. now. And, um, like, everybody as a DM got their different strong points. Um, Mike here, he's excellent at crafting his own worlds and his own locations and in his entire own setting. Uh, my, my skills are more along the lines of uh, you're actually building That and pieces. stringing together an excellent storyline. I think you craft a very good storyline. Oh, well, thanks. And overarching, <laughs> uh, this, this Salt Marsh campaign we've been on, it's been probably, but like you said, two modules out of the book, and you managed to string yeah. all of our backstories and weave it all together. It's been a very good, cohesive story throughout it all. Which, which was my my goal here, and to build the best sets that I could build with all the tools that I have at my disposal. Because mm-hmm. coming from like the war game background, the painting and the modeling background, like that's where my skills lie. So I like I lean on my strong skills to yeah. make memorable campaigns in D D. So like if you're if you're a great if you're a great voice actor or you're great at crafting stories, anything that you're really good at as a DM, mm-hmm. like lean on your strong suits and your players will remember that. Yeah. And the other thing as a DM is don't be afraid if you don't have something to if you know your players might have it or have access to it, yep. don't be afraid to ask. Even if you're thinking like, "Oh no, I can't say that because they'll know what's coming." You don't want me, to surprise them. Yeah, 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 me, me, and Troy, we bounce back. We pretty much share a pool of miniatures and yeah. terrain pieces and whatever we have. We've uh, put together full set pieces where it's like, "Well, I got to get this done in time, but I'm never going to have enough yeah. time to do it." So like, you come over, help me paint this, and then I'm going to start 3D Q, uh, 3D printing Q this, and then you 3D uh, print this. And then we'll bring it all together and we'll make this big impressive set piece that even if I I know what is almost on the go with the set, I'm still impressed by the set piece as a whole when yeah, it's done. When it's done. And, and so that's a good point. Like, I, There's always at least one member of my party who, who know might know a little bit what's coming up because I lean out I'm like hey do you have a white dragon miniature yeah. <laughs> why Troy <laughs> yeah. why do you want to never mind why <laughs> do you have one <laughs> 
And sometimes I'll just ask for shit and not use it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's this always swirl, a fun curveball when you're into loop. this thing. It's like, do you yeah. have like a, a manticore that I could borrow for a night? <laughs> it's like, what manticore? And it's like, yeah, don't worry about it. And then it could be just a statue in the corner somewhere. Yes, yeah, so don't don't worry about letting your players in if you need a hand with stuff. They're you know they're there to help and have a good time. So guys, uh, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you like this, uh, hit that subscribe button. We're going to be doing videos like this from now on for, for the builds that we do. Some of them are pretty impressive. Some of them are smaller in scale, but there's always a fun story and there's a fun rules and a few tips we'd like to pass along to you. Mm. So there's, uh, there's one in particular we're getting geared up to start now. I'm really excited to get that one on the go, but uh, we're not going to quite unveil it yet, so stay no. tuned and you are you're going to be impressed. We're going to do a whole build series on that one, so that'll, that'll take you from the ground up. I hope you like Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Talk to you later. Take care. See ya.